I would love to focus this interview a lot about uh, youth and teenagers. And my first question for you, according to you, how to help youth or teens to find their own way? Regardless of age, yeah. even in a young infant, a child, there is an observation that can be made of what they show interest in. Even a baby laying in a crib is noticing things and avoiding things. So regardless of age, in each stage of development, each child and or teenager has what is called a hierarchy of values, a set of priorities that they live their life by and that they make their decisions by. This set of priorities that they have is unique to them. And there are some things that they do that they have spontaneously do. They love doing, they're inspired by it. You don't ever have to remind them to do it. You don't, they don't need any motivation to do it. Yeah. No incentives, they just do it. There's other things that they resist and they don't want to do and they're bored and they procrastinate, they hesitate, they frustrate. Mm. Identifying what that is, regardless of age, allows them to be respected as individuals with unique sets of values from parents, teachers, or others. And identifying what that is and honoring that is the first step. Great. Because as long as we project autocratically, authoritatively on what they're supposed to think, believe, focus on, etc., we're going to get the natural resistance that everybody has. If anybody came to you and told you how to think and do it, you would resist it and you'd fight it. So first find out what they're inspired by. That's the wise thing. First find out what their life demonstrates spontaneously that's, that they love. Mm. <clears throat> the second thing, as a parent, yeah. is to ask yourself how they're dedicated to that. How is that dedication that they have? How is it serving you as a parent? Because if you can't see what they're dedicated to yeah. is serving you, you're going to have a natural tendency to want to change it, want to fight it, want to resist it, want to, want to fix it. You're going to think that they're lazy. You're going to, want, you're going to throw labels on them because you're going to want to try to make them somebody that they're not right now inspired to be. So first find out what it is and ask yourself as a parent, how specifically as my son or daughter being dedicated to this action, how is it helping me fulfill what's important to me? So you need to know yourself and know what you're inspired by, what's meaningful to you, what your goals are, not social idealism, but what your life's demonstrating is important to you and find out how what they're dedicated to serving you. Because mm. there's not a mistake in the family dynamic why that child is doing what it's designed to do. Because children are designed to express repressions of parents <laughs> and they're designed to live out things that they haven't been wounded by in their own family life that haven't loved and they're there to teach them how to love things. Yeah. So first find out what they're dedicated to and find out how they're serving you as a parent. And don't just do it answer at one time. Answer that until you're actually grateful for them being who they are. Because when you're grateful who they are, the way they are, they turn into who you love. Wow. Basic principle. Once you do... You now, just like a customer in, in a company yeah. or an employee in a company, if you communicate what you want in terms of what they want, you go farther. Mm. It's, you like, can't, it's like speak Chinese to an Englishman. Otherwise, <laughs> it's like speaking a foreign language. Yeah. So if a, a customer, if you're smart, you would never think about trying to help a customer without first establishing a need and what they're dedicated to, what they want. Once you listen to what they want, because telling is not telling, it's asking questions, you then try to see, first of all, if what you have to offer will serve that. And if you have, you try to word it in such a way where they'll get their values met, their needs met. So whatever you're trying to communicate to the child, it's wise to know what the values and priorities of the child are, what their life demonstrates, not what they tell you, but what their life demonstrates. And master the art of communicating what's important to you in terms of what's important to them. Mm. If you do, they automatically open up to you because whenever they feel they're getting what they're wanting, they open up, they calm down, they're, they're a different child. Mm. I've trained many parents and blown their minds because <laughs> their teachers and the parents have labeled their kids with disobedient disorder, defiant disorder, attention deficit disorder, all these labels. And once the parent mastered the art of this exercise and went in there and communicated in the child's values, the child was enormously different and amazingly receptive, open to do what the parents would love to do because the parents respected the child to communicate what the parent wanted in terms of the child's values. Right. Now the child's values is evolving 
And so the parent has to have enough caring about the child to keep an eye on what that new value is. Because when it's three to five, it may be wanting to play with a certain little game. Uh, later on, it may be wanting to socialize, or it may want to start to explore, or travel, or do things, or hang out and party. Whatever it is, instead of making it wrong, which creates them further into a disobedience, care enough to find out how it is and reflect on your own life and remember where you were in that phase and look back at that. When you did that, and when you do that, they're receptive, and you can take whatever it is that you would love for them to know, and you can share it with them, or love to do, and share it with them. They have a sensory cortex and a motor cortex, and whatever you want them to know or to do, if you communicate in their values, you make that neuroplastically receptive to what you're up to. And the child is now more in line with what you do, not because they're obedient, but because they're inspired to fulfill what it is, and you've shown them a way to help them do it. Right. If you love them for who they are, they turn into who you love. It's a basic principle. Anytime you label a child, every time I've seen it, it's been a poor the ability, the parents have had a poor ability to communicate in their child's values. Because I've gone up that same child. I just had one the other day. I just had a 16-year-old boy. The father's ready to kick him out of the house. Said, I'm done. I can't handle this anymore. You're disruptive, disobedient. You're this. And label after label after label. You're not going to school. You're not doing this. You're not doing... I sat with him on the phone for 42 minutes. Find out what he's dedicated to, what his life demonstrated, find out what he's inspired by. His father was wanting another world for him, another life for him. And I told him, I said, I explained to him how you can do that. He was receptive, he was focused, he was there, he was inspired, he had a new strategy. I got a contact back from his father about an hour later. It's it said, a new what, what did you do? And I said, I just helped him fulfill what his dream is. And respect who he is. And respect who he is. Master that art, you'll see your son do amazing things. Everybody has a hidden genius. Every teenager, child, whatever the age, has a hidden genius in there and has something inspiring that they want to dedicate that makes a difference in the world. Finding out what that is without judging it is the first step. Great. Learning how to communicate what you feel would be benefit to them. But remember, as a parent, you don't want to project onto the child all your wounds and all your fears, because anything you've been wounded about that you feel hurt by, that you haven't found the benefits to, sometimes you want to protect your child from that. And you think it's caring, but it's actually stopping them from reminding you of that fear that you need to break through, and you're doing it in a way you think is caring. It's not. It's not caring. It's actually projecting your own wounds onto kids. Yes. And that's labeled caring by some perpetrator, innocent model psychologist. But the real truth is that child is capable of doing extraordinary things, and we do better by exemplifying mastery of our own life than we do by trying to prevent them from you know, going through what our wounds are. So the best thing a parent can do is go do something inspiring and amazing with their life, yeah. something that's extraordinary, and make a massive contribution. And through the mirror neurons of the brain, the child will pick that up and say, I want to do something amazing too. Yeah, become a source of inspiration. For, Be a source of inspiration. For, for, for yourself and for your, for that's your children. It. That's the greatest teacher there is on the planet. And uh, I have a question also about um, values. Do you think the values change uh, in the life or the order change? or we are born with value, uh, with the same value, according to you? Values definitely change. Maslow, in his personality and motivation, described um, a hierarchy of values, a hierarchy of needs. Um, many have done that, not just him. But, and there's basically the first one, the very primary one that all human beings have, is oxygen. They want to breathe. Uh, and if they have asthma, that's the highest priority in their life. They want to be able to breathe. Then water then food, then reproduction, then clothing, then shelter, and it goes up from there. Those are basic survival values. Some people in the world, if you've been in Africa or Asia and places where they don't even have those things, those are basic essentials that they have to get first. Then once you have shelter and clothing and food and things, you tend to want to upgrade it and you want to hold on to it and you want to secure it. So from survival comes security. You want to pre pre prevent somebody else from taking from you. So you want to close your house. You want to protect your goods and stuff so somebody can't steal it because then you're back in survival again. So security comes next. And so anything that a person's in survival going into security, they're going to want to secure anything and, and accumulate things to make sure that they don't have that anxiety again. The next one is kind of a so socialization where you want to interact with other people, kind of show off what you've got, 
uh, and influence people with it and have some sort of identity. And, to impress people. Yeah, impress people. And then Maslow said that there's another level where you're trying to now realize, you know what, these people are reflections of me. And if I help them get what they want, I get what I want. So you've gone past security, and now you're into past socialization, you're now in self-esteem, you want to be a leader trying to make a difference in other people. Mm. And finally you self-actualize, and you realize that, as Schopenhauer says, we become our true self to the degree that we make everyone else our self. And that is everything. So we realize that nothing's missing in us, we have everything, we don't have to compare ourselves, we just need to share what's true for us in an inspired way, in a way where everybody gets to get what they want in life. So there's a level of it, and each one of those levels have different needs and value systems. And can, can we say that we, our values don't change, but our focus change because we are building our... Yes. Our building. <laughs> You're building layer upon layer. Yeah. It's a strata. It's like sediments in anthropology or archaeology. So um, these strata grow, and every time you fulfill a need, there's a slight shift in your needs. There's two evolutionary methods to changing needs. One is called the uniformin hypothesis, or the gradual hypothesis. One is the punctate cataclysmic hypothesis. One is that if you're living by your highest values and you're feeling self-actualized and you feel you're inspired by your life, then you quickly, resiliently adapt to changing environments based on needs and you're slowly but surely making slight changes on your values. If you're not fulfilled in your highest values and you feel that you've been subordinated and oppressed and you feel that you're injecting values of other people and you feel like you're not fulfilling your life, then sometimes you have to have cataclysmic events to make change. Mm. That's hitting the bottom as, as drug addicts do. Because I always say that addiction is a byproduct of unfulfilled highest values, addictive behavior. Yeah. Immediate gratification and addictive behavior is a byproduct of unfulfilled highest values. So the, finding out what those values are, being honest with who you are, not subordinating to social idealisms and authorities around you and comparing yourself to other people thinking they have a better life, and living authentically and only comparing your actions to your own dreams allows you to live according to your highest values and gives you permission to do something extraordinary on the planet. When you do, you resiliently adapt to changing environments rapidly and you're able to spontaneously and intuitively do with whatever is needed to whoever you're around and you have a great capacity to do leadership capacities. And you can handle paradoxes and handle the dualities of life and the, pre the, the pairs of opposites that life is always providing. Yeah. And uh, this is the mastery. And if we live it ourselves as parents, and we help children do that, they migrate through their values and change. And we're here to learn how to love all the values because all values on the planet are ultimately serving or they wouldn't be there. They would have gone extinct. So learning how to do that allows us to broaden our own horizons and appreciate people from different faiths and cultures and beliefs and, and mores and traditions and conventions. So the keeping that and helping us grow to realize that we're literally a, a, a global being. Mm -hmm. We're here to learn and love all the parts and see how all the parts live. There's a law in political social culture that's called the law of uh, aristic escalation, which means that whatever somebody's dedicated to, there's somebody dedicated to the opposite. These yeah. pairs of opposites <laughs> are all over the world. Yeah. And if you can actually handle those pairs of opposites and know how to negotiate and communicate in all pairs of opposites, you master your life, you self-actualize. So all the values are moving from a point where it's survival to eventually thrival and self-actualization and doing what we learn to love ourselves and others. If people had only 24 hours to live in their life, they would say thank you, I love you to the people who've contributed to their life. And every human being, no matter what race, creed, color, age, or sex, wants to be loved and appreciated for who they are. So that's the pinnacle, the essence of our existence is thank you, I love you. Mm. So all values eventually lead to the point where they're self-actualizing. The highest value of an individual, regardless of age, is what is called the telos, which is the end in mind, which is called the chief aim by Napoleon Hill or the magnificent obsession by Atelison or the primary objective by others. It is the purpose. It's the most meaningful thing we can do. And so each person at any moment in their evolutionary journey always has the highest value. And the collection of those throughout their life is their life journey. But at any moment, that's the purpose that they dedicate their lives to. Right. And that child deserves to be honored for that. When I work with education systems in the world, uh, in Africa or in uh, India or whatever it is, when I help people find out what that is in the child and help link all the curriculums to it, and teach the to teachers and parents how to communicate in that, it's amazing, I mean, literally amazing what happens to the children. All the labels are gone, the diseases are gone, the medications that they get stuck on are gone, they and these are inspired, their power. They, they unleash their power. 
And I would love to know because just before I was talking about a, a child, for example, who have who don't know what what you want to do. There are other kind of children. They they want to do that and that and that. There are a lot of goals and dreams. Um, according to you, they have to focus on only one, or can they achieve the five five goals, five dreams? Well, <clears throat> in the hierarchy of values, numero uno, the number one is the highest. And anytime you work by the highest values, your self worth goes up. Anytime you go down to lower values, your self-worth goes down. When your self-worth goes down and you feel unfulfilled, you tend to look for immediate gratification. So you tend to scatter and you tend to try to multitask. But when you find out what's real, most meaningful to you and you learn the art of asking, how is whatever I'm doing in my life helping me fulfill that, you're able to concentrate your energies and master something. That's the pathway of the master. But that doesn't mean that that one thing can't include many other components and you can master many different subcomponents inside it and become a polymathic student of life and learn many different things as long as it's focused on one thing. Mm. I'm a polymath. I've studied many different <laughs> disciplines, 287 different disciplines. But its main focus is the evolution of awareness and potential and the evolution of human consciousness. So because I focus on that, everything I study goes to that. Everything I do goes to that. One focus, I but you had some accessories to, to build that. Yeah, I, I, co I keep focused for 41 years on this one objective. But at the same time, I've, I've explored many different fields, many different things. So you're capable of integrating and linking things to the highest value. And you can get multiple things done and run. I mean, Richard Branson runs 300 companies through delegation and integration. Do you, you focus, for example, for two years on only one topic and then one other and then one other? Not necessarily. I may, I may be doing it, but as long as I link it to one primary objective, I can, I can get a lot of information put together. So a person typically who scatters and is, becomes a master of nothing and becomes a, <laughs> you know, they usually dilute themselves unless it's linked to one focus that they can identify that by. Your highest value is your ontological identity. So finding out what that highest value is is the most important. And then if you want to do multiple things, link it to it. Mm -hmm. If you do, you can focus on. If you have a bunch of balls in the air and you try to juggle them, if you look at any one ball, you'll drop the other ones. But if you look in the center, you can juggle five balls looking at the center and juggle all those together. Wow. It's not really multitasking, it's single tasking. It's just they're all integrated to the task. Great, I love that. I have a, a global question to ask you. Uh, according to you, what is the, the meaning of the life? Well, whatever is highest on an individual's values, regardless of age, at that moment is the most meaningful thing they can do, and it's what they project as meaning onto their existence. So universally, you won't be able to find any one meaning that laps it. All through the ages, the philosophers have tried to find the highest virtue, the highest meaning, the highest whatever. But it's individualized, but it all collectively integrates to ultimately what inspires the individual on that level. That's the most meaningful thing. Some people, it's dedicated their life to raising a family. Some people are dedicated to social cause. Some people are dedicated to fitness and health and yoga. Some people are dedicated to scholarly research and finding a solution to a problem in the world. Some are basically willing to go to space. Whatever is most highest on their value, what inspires them is the most meaningful thing. Because the teleology, which is the study of purpose and meaning, is the study of the telos, which is the highest value. Wow. That is the most meaningful thing you can do. But yeah. no two people have exactly the same meaning, just like no two people have the same vantage point and viewpoint about anything or perception. And I would like to also have a point of, your point of view about something. My question is, maybe I will have some results and I will market products for people to have the same results. But some of, this, some of these people can't maybe have the, this, the same results. You say just before that some, some people want to grow families, some others want to have an impact in the world. But maybe the people who are in the family want to have an impact in the world, but they can't, they can't. Okay, that's an important question because as I travel the world and speak, yeah. I'm sometimes in front of thousands of people, and I ask them, how many of you want financial independence? Yeah. Every hand goes up. I said, have you, how many of you have it? 99% of it goes down. I said, isn't it interesting that 100% of you have your hands up, but only 1% do it, how come? And they go blank. I said, let me teach you why and how that occurs and why that's that way. Because, and what I do is I have them go through and write down on a piece of paper the 10 things they would do if I gave them $10 million right now. Well, the 10 things they'd quickly do, write it down in one minute, you go, go write down 10 things you would do. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and they quickly rush down what they would do if they had $10 million. And I said, now look at that and turn it to the person next to you. And you will notice something. The people that say they want $10 million 
have just spent their money. Or want, they want to be financially independent, they, have, they just spent their money. The people who are financially independent just invested it. So what happens is many people have a fantasy of financial independence, but yeah. what they do is they imagine themselves spending the money and living the lifestyle. But the people that actually make financial independence are not those people. They're the ones that actually go, what would I do in investing this money and make sure it's put into appreciables and invested wisely so it's growing instead of spending? So as long as you have a higher value on spending than saving and investing, your values will make sure that saying you get money, it's going to be spent, not saved, invested. So many people live in a fantasy and they don't know what their real values are. Their life is demonstrating the real values, but they're injecting fantasies from everybody else that they admire into their life and living in the vicariously through them as a spectator, not a participator. And as long as they do, they're going to beat themselves up with what I call the ABCDs of negativity, anger and aggression, blame and betrayal, criticism and challenge, despondency, despair and depression, because they're constantly going to beat themselves up because they're expecting themselves to live outside their own values. So in order to be financially independent, you have to have the values that will lead you there because that va those values will determine how you see the world, decide in the world, and act in the world. And if you don't see opportunities, you don't decide and don't act in a way that leads you to financial independence, it's not going to happen. So many people live in a fantasy about what they think they want to do, but your life demonstrates what you do. So I always not pay attention to what people say, I look at what they do. Mm. And do you think we can, everybody can learn that? Everybody can learn to become a millionaire? Or is there only, are there only some people who can become a millionaire? Everybody has the capacity. The potential is always there. Yeah. Who actualizes that potential will be based on their values. So I have courses on that. And what I do in those courses, one of them is where's my billion. And I basically go in there and I help them identify what their values are now. And when they look and find out what they actually are, they go, oh, gosh, no wonder I'm the way I am. Yeah, great. And I go, whoa. And so in the process they do, I say, well, that hierarchy of values is leading you to your destiny. Because your hierarchy of values dictates your destiny. So if you want to change the destiny and become financial independence, we're going to have to shift some values. And I show them the science of shifting values, which is a neuroplastic science of altering the value system in order to get the outcome that you want. And it's essential. Otherwise, if those values, anytime you set a goal that doesn't match the values or have values that don't match the goals, you have unfulfillment. But once they're congruent, you have fulfillment. Yes, right. Anytime somebody looks up to you and subordinates to you and think you have something they don't, yeah. they'll have a tendency to inject what they think your values are into their life. And they'll subordinate, and they'll start moving away from their own highest value, and they'll go into try to live by your values and try to mirror and match and try to be somebody they're not. But envy is ignorance and imitation is suicide. And Albert Einstein said, my contempt for authority made me one. So he was unwilling to subordinate to people. He was willing to listen to his own voice. I said on The Secret, when the voice and the vision on the inside is louder than all opinions on the outside, you begin to master your life. So the willingness to be authentic to yourself is few and far between on the people on the planet. Because most people minimize themselves because they subordinate themselves to others, expect themselves to live in other values and idealisms and social expectations, and they don't give themselves permission to be the genius that they actually are. And that stops people from empowering themselves. So the truth is people can, anybody has the capacity to build wealth or to build health or whatever they want, but they're going to have to shift their values in order to manifest it. And there is a price to pay to, to shift values. Well, there's only one way to transcend the price that I've seen. And it's a very masterful art of seeing that nothing's missing. Because the very values themselves are derived from voids. If you think you don't have money, you search for money. If you think you have no relationship, you search for relationship. Whatever you think is missing becomes important. So if you can see that nothing's missing by knowing how to ask the right question, which I train people in the Breakthrough Experience in my programs, then they realize that the void's not really there in the first place. That was an illusion of the mind that they had and the senses that they, they didn't see where they had it. So what I do is I take people that think they don't have money, for instance, and I ask them, so everybody has wealth, but it's in the form of their highest values. So the wealth may be the way you have your relationship with your children. That's worth a fortune. And somebody could pay you millions and say, I wouldn't give up my children for that. It's worth millions. Or they may say, uh, spiritual quest. And they said, I'd pay you a billion dollars to lose all that spiritual awareness. No, I'd keep my spiritual awareness more than money. As long as they value other things more than money, they're going to pay money for those things. And they're not going to accumulate wealth. So they have to value money in order to accumulate money. And they have to have it value it more than the things that they're now putting their energies and time and money into. So we have to find out what their values are. We have to then find out what their values they say they want. And then we have to readjust <laughs> the values and move in that direction. And in they, doing so, 
We have to also show them how everything is helping them get that and show them that nothing's ultimately missing. It's just in forms they're not honoring. Yeah. And when they do, amazing things can happen. I have two last questions. According to you, how to be healthy with food? How do you eat? Well, my personal uh, regime, regime <clears throat> may not be what's wise for everybody. It's what I've found to be wise for me. Great. I learned from Mahatma Gandhi. When I was 18 years old, I read the entire memoir series of Mahatma Gandhi. And he did on a daily basis an inventory of everything he ate and how wow. he felt physically, emotionally, etc. So I create a chart when I was 18 years old that basically had uh, the time of the day, uh, liquids, solids, anything I ate, uh, my physical responses, my emotional responses, and any <laughs> insights. And I create a chart. I've kept it all these years. Wow. And I did it, and all through the day I did my journal to find out everything I ate, when did I feel it, did I feel tired, did I feel energized, did I get angry, did I this, anything that went on through the day, and I looked at the patterns, and I discovered what the patterns were for me. And I then experimented, once I saw the patterns, experimented with different foods and different patterns and times of eating and quantity of eating and fasting and everything else to find out what worked and what didn't work for me. I did this for two solid years, and then unconsciously after that, because it became normal, I learned about what works for me. But I can't say that it worked for everybody else. So I yeah, advise I people to look so, within yeah, yeah. instead of listen to without at all times. Although there may be some general principles that are wise to follow from the outside. What do you think, for example, about milk? Well, some people in some cultures with some genetic backgrounds do fine with milk. And other people, really, the second they drink milk, they get congestion and they start having reactions and things of this nature. But when I went and traced that, I found that many of the people, when they were a child, when they drank milk, They had parenting fighting and yelling and screaming and things and they associated it with it and they started having allergic reactions and revolting against milk. So what I do is if I see a reactions to food, I also make sure it's not just emotional reactions from earlier parts of their life and clear that. And many times those foods are fine after that. So you have to discern whether it is a reaction from emotions or it's actually the foods in deciding what's working and not working for you. And I had to learn that over time and I did it for myself and now I help my students with that. <clears throat> But there are certain food patterns that have proven pretty standard. Overeating is not wise. If you eat, uh, like it's an old proverb that says, if you eat to gain energy, it's like fighting for peace. You're not going to get there. <laughs> so it's wiser to eat light if you want to be enlightened. And it's wise to eat light at night because it's not wise to lay down and after eating because it pushes in the stomach and the diaphragm and it blocks the, dis the dynamic excursion of the dia diaphragm, which is the dynamo of energy in the body. So it's wise to eat light at night. It's wise to um, not wait, at least. If you eat a very uh, snack, it's wise to wait an hour. If you eat a small meal, two hours. If it's a big, moderate meal, three hours. If it's a big meal, four hours before you lie down. Or if you do have to go to bed, lie down at an angle so you don't end up having the stomach pushed up in the diaphragm and block your energy levels and feel really tired the next day. So there's certain sciences that's basically applied physiology that's common. It's wise to make sure that you have lots of water because you need fluids in your body. It's wise to eat light because if you gain weight and go over the weight, you have an increasing probability of diabetes, heart disease, many of the other concerns. But if you eat less, your longevity goes up. One of the keys of longevity is basically food um, restriction. And um, people that fast a little bit or eat very light and a little underweight live longer than people that are overweight. So uh, caloric restriction has been known to increase longevity. Having a purpose in life that's inspiring to you. So you eat to not eat to live, but live, no. Not live to eat, but eat to live is wiser. People that just, I always say that consumerism is a, a dopamine driven response to an unfulfilled highest value. So people that are unfulfilled, they'll tend to eat. People that are inspired, they don't have time to eat. They're too busy doing what they love to do. So <laughs> fill your day with things that inspire you and eat to live, not live to eat. This is the secret of longevity. Right.